In Matthew chapter 7, we're going to continue to the book of Philippians, but in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is teaching what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And you don't have to turn there. I just want you to listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus really um, is, is laying down deposits for the people who have a hunger and craving for him. And these deposits are really meant to grow. They're meant to nourish and flourish. And so Jesus is dropping these, these, these spiritual deposits that he yearns and desires for them to grow. But I want, I want you to hear something because the way these deposits are going to grow are going to be through obedience. Listen, I, I want you to hear that and don't miss that because the way Jesus is going to nourish and flourish these deposits, spiritual deposits in their life, is he will water them and they will produce fruit through their obedience. It's more than just listening to the word of God and what Jesus had to say, but it is the application and obedience is what really draws out the power of God. It's kind of like this, when, when Moses in Exodus chapter 14, when he was leading the Israelites, and I, I want you to hear this because uh, they saw Jesus move in their lives, or God move in their lives over and over and over again. They came to the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14, and what happens? Exodus chapter 14, the Egyptian, the Israelites say, hey, we want to stay back in Egypt. We'd rather be in bondage than to move on faith. Hey, we, hey we, 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 want to, we want to bow down to Pharaoh and from the Egyptians. We fear Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So God, let us stay with them in bondage versus walking on faith and experiencing you. And the dangerous thing, you look at this passage and the dangerous thing is this, like how we can be so comfortable in our dysfunction that we rather stay in our dysfunction until it becomes our normal way of functioning. And some of us get way too comfortable living in our bondage because we're too afraid to walk out and experience freedom. Because at least in our bondage, we know what we have, right? We know the dysfunction. We know how it's going to go. And we have made bondage our home. The Israelites made bondage their home. I like this brokenness. At least I know what it's going to offer me. No more surprises. You get Moses and the people are saying, how is the Red Sea going to part? How is, and here's what God tells Moses, stop crying and do this. In other words, stop being the victim. Stop playing the victim. You have the almighty, powerful God leading you. All you need to do is be obedient and don't fear man. And so he tells Moses, stretch out your hand. And watch what I'm going to do. So Moses stretches out his hand and God and the power of God parts the Red Sea. What do you see? Moses, obedience, God, power. Many of us want to experience his power without obedience. You have to be obedient in order to experience his power. So Jesus is speaking to the people who are, I believe, who are hungry to know him. They're hungry to know the things of God. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he's saying when you're obedient, you're building a strong foundation for your life. When you're obedient today, it's going to help you tomorrow. When you're obedient today, it'll help you tomorrow. It's building a foundation on the rock. And then he gives them the example about the person who's obedient to the word of God. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So Jesus is saying, when you're obedient, you build a foundation for yourself that can withstand the storms of life. It's not a if the storms of life will come, it's when the storms of life will come. For every person in this room, you will experience at some point in your life to different categories of storms in your life. You will experience it. It's inevitable. They're going to come. And he's saying the person that will be able to withstand it is the one who placed their faith in Jesus and applies the word. Then he says this, but then there's another category of, of people. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. 
Every single one of us in here today have, have intentionally or unintentionally have done some things. We have poured into some relationships or built some relationships that you never thought would turn. You've poured your life and given your all and you've been raw and open and honest and transparent. <laughs> and and, and you, you, you saw in this relationship how tight you got only to experience. And here's the thing, you, you, you found this relationship and here's what we can do sometimes. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's like, it's like we're looking for some substance to make sense and we found this relationship and it makes sense now and we hold on to the relationship so tightly like be my everything, be my all, make sense. Don't ever leave me nor forsake me. Don't hurt me. But the reality is, is Jesus is saying, look, when you put your confidence in anything else but me, it's like sinking sand. It's not going to be of anything, of any substance. Because look, your best friend will fail you. Because they're human. The person sitting next to you will fail you. Because they're human. Your boss, who you've given so many hours to and been so faithful to, will hurt you and fail you and promote someone else and not you, and it'll hurt. Your own loved ones and your family, they will hurt you and you won't be able to comprehend how can even this person hurt me? I thought they were for me. Your spouse, how can somebody like this hurt me? How can this happen? You will over and over and over cling on to things in life intentionally and unintentionally, and you will recognize there is no true substance because anything but Christ is flawed. And you will invest yourself in people, and you will be loyal and you will sacrifice. Here's the crazy thing, is many of us are loving things that will never love us back. Many of us are sacrificing for things that will never sacrifice for you. And then we're so disappointed when the human, disappointed when the human heart is revealed. Let me tell you something, this church will disappoint you because it's ran by humans. Your pastor will disappoint you because I'm human. And you will be disappointed over and over and over again, over again, and you will be betrayed and people will be jealous of you and people will be insecure of you and people will be critical of you and people, and then here is probably the worst thing. It's easy to say, yes, these people do it to me, but what about when you have disappointed yourself, when you've held on so tightly to your morality or your accol accolades and they didn't come through and you keep failing into the same sin and you're so disappointed in yourself. Let me just tell you, it's going to happen because we're human. And what Jesus is saying is like, look, here's what you're going to understand. If you put all your chips in a relationship and you forsake me, you're going to recognize that relationship is going to do this eventually. If you put all your chips in a career and you forsake me, this is what's going to happen. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm just trying to warn you. If you put all your chips into a marriage, if you put all your chips into a child and the child doesn't turn out the way you raise them, it's going to happen. Maybe, I don't know, but if it does. If, if you put all your chips into the church and the church hurts you, then where do you, where do you go from there? And so Jesus is saying, look, many of you are putting all your chips and you're building your foundation and your confidence and your faith and your livelihood in people. And I'm just here to tell you, like, it's not going to last. But here's the thing. You can walk, you can love, you can trust, you can do what you can. But recognize at the end of the day, the only solid, constant, and sustainable foundation is Jesus and Jesus Christ only. Can you imagine how much pain we'd save ourselves if we walk into relationships recognizing this person's going to hurt me some way or another one day? 
Isn't it true? I, 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 can't, I don't know how many times I have said something from the pulpit, not on purpose, that has probably really frustrated you. I said a word that just triggered you and you, all of a sudden you were upset. Or, or your employer, or, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And so if this is the reality, it's like, well, this doesn't sound like much fun. We're going to experience betrayal and pain and all of this stuff. Well, then what's the point of Christianity? And then here's what Paul is saying today through Philippians. He's almost echoing the sentiment of what Jesus is saying in here, of saying, look, um, the storms in your relationships will come. Amen. The storms in your workplace will come. The storms in your church, do not amen that one, <laughs> will and can come to other churches in the name of Jesus. So, you jump into Philippians if this is the reality, when Jesus is telling us, if you build your foundation on anything else but Jesus, you're going to be let down when the storms come. Your career, what do you do when the storms come and you've invested everything in your career? What do you do when you invested everything in relationships? What do you, what do, you do when it doesn't pan out the way you thought it was going to pan out? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul, just to remind you, understands all of this. Paul was very faithful to God. And, and here's the thing. We will be tempted to even be disappointed with God. Let's just be honest. How many of us in here, and don't raise your hand, have tried your best to serve God, but sometimes it doesn't seem like life is getting any better? And then you wonder... Where are you, God? Paul is writing, mind you, from what scholars believe this prison cell. They believe he's writing from this actual prison cell. Where are Paul's friends? They're not there. Well, he invested so much in them. He, he mentored them. He discipled them. Where are they? In fact, some of the guys he poured into, talk about betrayal, some of the guys that Paul poured into were saying this, yes, Paul's in prison, now we can grow our church. They're nowhere to be found because they were threatened by his presence. So now you have Paul who invested everything in these people. He, he raised them up and led them and they betrayed him. You ever experienced that? It's like now your presence is a nuisance to my kingdom. And so they betrayed him. They're like, we're glad you're in prison because we can build our church and we can be the new cool thing on the block. So he's experiencing that. What are the resources? He has no re That's what he has right there. What about God? Where is God during this time? So Paul has every right to have the temptation to be angry at God, be angry at his friends, and be a bitter, bitter person. And instead, this is how he responds. Look at verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. He uses this over 16 times in this book, saying what? Hey, I'm in the prison cell, but I still have confidence. What do you have confidence in? Your, your friends betrayed you. What do you have confidence in? You've been preaching the gospel, being faithful, and you're about to die. You're about to be beheaded. What do you have confidence in? So he speaks of this confidence. He uses this word several times, but he says rejoice. So he gives us the idea that he is doing okay. And he's telling everybody else from the prison cell, rejoice. You can do okay in your own personal prison cell. And then he says this, I'm going to say something to you that you've already heard. Much like many of you, um, if you hear a scripture or hear a story in the Bible, you're kind of like, I've already kind of heard that already. And we can tend to tune it out. He's telling them the very same thing. I'm going to tell you something I've already told you. To write the same things to you. And, and you, may, you may ask, why did he say this? You've heard of the uh, theologian Martin Luther. Martin Luther uh, was preaching and he preached the gospel every single Sunday. One of his congregants waited to talk to him afterwards. The congregant came up to him and said, Hey, uh, Pastor Martin Luther, why do you preach the gospel every single Sunday? Every Sunday, you tell us about Jesus, same old stuff. Why do you do this? You know what he said? Because you forget it every single Monday. <laughs> I tell you every Sunday because you forget it every Monday is what Martin Luther said. 
And so here he's saying, it's like, here's why, because um, when you're walking and living for Christ, there's going to be all these distractions, and it's almost like, yeah, we heard this, but when, when relationships break, we're angry, as if we didn't hear what the message said on the Sunday before. Or when you go back to work tomorrow, and you're like, you know what, that same employer, employer is a jerk. But pastor said they would be a jerk. What do I do with this? Sorry. So he says this, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how you can have confidence when the things around you are breaking and the things around you and the wind is blowing in your life and storms are coming and the things are falling apart. I'm going to tell you how you can have confidence. And here's what he says. I want you to take a look here in verse two. He calls out, verse two, he calls out, he says, look out for the dog. So I want you to hear this very clearly. He tells them, rejoice. How do you rejoice? He says, here's how you rejoice, okay? This is really important for all of us in here today. Look out for the dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What is he talking about? If you've never read the Bible, it's okay, I'm about to tell you. So here's what he's saying. It is possible that your life feels like it's going to shambles and it's possible that you can still have confidence today in this room. Well, how do you do it? He says, here's how you do it. Number one, do not believe, do not believe false teachings that fill the flesh but empty the soul. Let me just tell you, it is dangerous for us today in our country, us in this room, when we, when our soul is hungry, it is dangerous to have a hungry soul because the hungry soul, uh, you have to be careful because the hungry soul will eat anything you put in front of it. And not everything you eat is a God thing, although it tastes like a good thing. And you have to be careful that when your soul is hungry that we run to quick fixes or we have Instagram theology to where we listen to these random clips from pastors who can sometimes take scripture out of context and what they're giving you is not true meat but sugar and there will be a sugar crash. And so what he's telling these people is like, yeah, life's going to be hard, but be careful. So today in our context, what I would tell you is, pastor, what would you say to be careful for? Be careful for the health and wealth prosperity gospel where people will tell you that everything's going to be okay. Because the truth is, Paul gets beheaded. Imagine someone preaching to Paul right now, and they write him a letter saying, hey, you just need more faith. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And he gets beheaded. He's thinking, did God leave me? Do I not have enough faith? And I'm not saying have faith in a powerful God, I am. But if God decides to do something mighty and powerful, if God decided to free him from the prison cell, it's because it is because of God and in spite of Paul. It is to bring himself glory. And so the souls today, much like then, you have to be very careful because a hungry soul will eat anything you put in front of it for a quick fix. So he tells them, be careful for the false teaching because there's a lot of hungry people out there eating a lot of false stuff. And here's what's interesting is, is, is you will know when you've been eating something false when you eat the real thing. When you eat steak, you know what I'm saying? I used to think those TV Salisbury steak dinners were the bomb. My mom used to bring those home, I was like, Oh, somebody got a raise today. You put them in the microwave, you put them on a real plate and make it feel like it's special. Then I ate a real steak at the Golden Corral and I was like, whoa, this is the bomb. This, this, this is it, mama. This is, this is what we've been missing out. So, so Paul says this, like, look, you want to know, you, you cling on, because here's the thing, even when you cling on to preachers and today uh, on social media, when they're not preaching the word of God, here's, here's what we're doing with good intention, with good intention, with good intention, we can hang on to a false teacher, and eventually it's this, and you're wondering why it didn't work. He said this, he said this and he sounds so eloquent when he said it, and he was filled with charisma. He surely is of God. He looked like it, he sounded like it, but, but, but. Good intention can lead us to bad places. Good intention can lead us to bad places. My, my six-year-old daughter um, is playing soccer. She's playing soccer in the last several weeks. Uh, every time they win a game, 
They're like, hey, congratulations, we're playing next week too. I'm like, <clears throat> like can they just lose already? I mean, six-year-old soccer, not much happens. And so um, last week they played and they won. And I was like, yay, get to see them run around. And this week, uh, it's tied like one to one and I'm not going to lie. I'm like, please don't win, please don't win, please don't win, please don't win, please don't win. <laughs> and then it's halftime. Here's what happens, it's, it's the cutest thing. After halftime, the kids forget that you switch goals because they're six. And you typically see them running toward the to score in the wrong goal. And then all of a sudden, you know, my wife is here and my wife's like, wrong goal. I'm like, shh. Like, Let them score so we can get out of here, girl. Let them score. So they're setting up. They're at midfield about to pass the ball in. And it's, it's the cutest thing. All the, the six-year-old girls are on the wrong side, protecting the wrong goal. And they look so just like, they're re- good intentions. They don't know any better, good intentions. They're sitting here like, let's get it, let's get it. And then you see the coach run out. I don't know if you've ever seen like any six-year-old coaches. They think like, it's like the championship is on the line or something. And the dude runs out all aggressive. Everybody stop. I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> it's the wrong way. You're supposed to be going that way. And the girls are like, oh. So they sprint that way. And I was upset about them correcting them. And then the play starts. So here's the thing what Paul is speaking to. Good intentions, wrong direction. Good intentions, wrong direction. So Paul is saying, hey, stop, stop. You're going the wrong way, wrong direction. The difference is, the direction they're going is the difference between death and life. Wrong direction. So then he tells them this. Look out for the false teachers who will make it sound good, but they will not heal the soul. The way you know who the false teacher is, is mon- on Sunday, you will be so inspired. On Monday, it'll be gone. When it's the Word of God on Sunday, you will hear truth. On Monday, it'll begin to transform. So he's saying, listen to who is false. And here's what he was saying is this time they were saying, yeah, Jesus is good, but you also need to be circumcised. You got to add something to who Jesus is in order to really be saved and a child of God. And then Paul says this. He says, now everyone don't believe that. Here's what you need to believe. If you are a Christian, we are the circumcision. He is speaking spiritual circumcision, not Physical. Physical in the Old Testament made you right with God to show that you were part of the covenant. In the New Testament, he's speaking of spiritual circumcision. Who spiritually circumcises? God does that. So he says, for we are the spiritual circumcision who worship. I want you to see something. Who worship by the Spirit of God. Watch this. When you get to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is a spiritual circumcision that makes you right with God. Here is the response. If you want to know today, am I a Christian? Do I know? God do I not know God here's a very clear way and it's very important that uh, we, we get this out here today and let me tell you why it's important you may think pastor we all know him let me share a sobering stat for you today in 2022 this year they they researched and surveyed evangelical Christians and 58 percent of the evangelical Christians believe that God accepts the worship of all religions 58% of Christians believe that God accepts it all, 58%. If that's not sobering enough for you, uh, 44% of evangelical Christians say that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And th- th- this, is, this is why, um, man, we, this is why I've said this before, but it seems like Jesus is, is not enough. Well, it's because these stats show that we're saying he's not. And so if you're wondering why this is important today, for some of us, this may just seem boring, but just like Paul, this was the difference between heaven and hell, life and death, which is a huge thing today, huge. And so Paul is saying, for we are, we know him. Well, how do I know if I know him, pastor? If you're in here today, my deep, deep desire is that you know him. I mean, I want every 
single person in this room today to truly know Jesus Christ and not just to get to heaven, but to know him, to know his power, to know that, you know what, I don't care what happens in life and it's not gonna be perfect, there's gonna be a lot of pain, but I know Jesus, to know him. I'm gonna be betrayed, but I know Jesus. My career won't go the way, but I know Jesus. I'll be hurt, but I, know, I won't even get it right. I'll be so messed up and I'll sin, but I know Jesus. And so this is what he's saying. Like, how do you know Jesus? He's saying, here's how you know that you know. And there's a spiritual circumcision. He says, a worship takes place. And I don't mean, hear, hear me, please hear me. I don't mean that we come up here and raise our hands because you can worship him with your flesh and not worship him with your spirit. Yeah, you can raise your hands. It doesn't mean we're worshiping with our spirit. So what he's saying is like, it's look, you encounter, there's a spiritual circumcision. You know Christ and you can't help but to worship Christ. Well, how do you worship God? How do you worship? You worship by the spirit that he has deposited in us. When you come to know Jesus Christ, there's a circumcision, a covenant between you and God. And that covenant's because Jesus is, is deposited, the, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is deposited in you, which then allows us to be able to worship the one true God. You can't worship God without the Spirit. You can raise your hands, but it doesn't mean you're worshiping God. And so he's saying, look, we're different. We're, we're different. They talk about the physical circumstances. We're talking about spiritual here. We worship God, and this word glory in the Greek means boast. We boast in Jesus Christ. That's the difference. We don't put confidence in our flesh because our flesh cannot get us in the right standing with God. So in this room, nothing you can do can get you in the right standing with God. It was everything Jesus had done. There's a lot of peace in that. Because if it depends on you, you're going to be discouraged quite often. Let's just be honest. How many times have we failed ourselves? A lot. And we will continue to. So he's saying we don't put confidence in ourselves. We can't. We're going to fail ourselves. Nor can our flesh appease the Spirit of God. Then he says this. It's like he's about to uh, bust out his resume. He's about to talk some theological trash. Look at verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence, this word confidence, the root is going to be pistis, means faith. Though I have reason for faith, for confidence, for assurance in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. All right, he's talking trash. Y'all ready? He's about to give his resume in just a minute. It'd be no different than if uh, LeBron James and Michael Jordan were talking about who's the better basketball player. Who's the better basketball player, church? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. That's a sign of a healthy church right there. That's a sign <laughs> of a very healthy church. I'm very proud of y'all. I'm very, I know I've been teaching the Bible correctly if you got Michael Jordan right. <laughs> In fact, a little quiz, who has more buzzer beaters, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Who says Jordan? Who says LeBron? Not all y'all are saved then. I, I, we got some work to do. Michael Jordan has more buzzer beaters. So Paul's like Michael Jordan in this instance. He's like, y'all want to talk about your buzzer beaters? Listen to my buzzer beaters. Listen to what he lists. Here we go. He said he was circumcised on the eighth day. I want you to think about it this way. It's as if he was baptized as an infant. So he's saying, I'm good with God because I was baptized as an infant. He saw it as a salvinic thing that he's speaking of, of the people of Israel. The people were the covenant people with God. They were a special group of people. So now he's saying, look, I was born into this. I'm from a great group of people, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Why is that important? King Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, uh, scholars would believe that, that Paul, his name was Saul before it was Paul, that he was named after King Saul. So now he's saying, look, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Of the pe I'm of the people of Israel. I was, I was born into the uh, tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. So now he's saying, all this, I was born into this goodness of stuff. It's like, but it doesn't stop there. You want to talk about how great of a person I am? Here's what he says, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, which means, man, I knew the law. I know this stuff. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, I was so passionate that I was obedient to what I thought I knew. Right intention, wrong direction. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. I was perfect. I was swagged out and sinless, is what he's saying. I had great morality. I was unbelievable. 
But he lists all these things one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight reasons why his resume is so great for God to love him. And here, here's a sobering thing today that he's helping us to understand and them. Listen to what he says. So if you're in here today, and these aren't bad things. These are good things, but it's a dangerous thing if you think good things will get you to God things because good things can keep you from God things. Some of us are appeased at the good things and we're missing out the God things. Some of us think the good things lead us to the God things. And here's what he's saying. These are good things. Born of a great family, fantastic I'm smart, fantastic, I got pedigree, I got degrees, fantastic. But here's what he says, but whatever gain I had, um, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So in here, if we're not careful, we are just going for these accolades in our lives and we're building and we're doing more and more and more. Not horrible, only horrible if it keeps you from knowing Christ. It's like some of us may, if we're not careful, I do this a lot. i got to check my heart, i got to check my mind, that we can come up with this plan for our lives and this strategy, which is good, and you ask God to join your plan versus you joining his. And it, happened, it happens a lot. And, and so he says, whatever gain I had, and I had it all. I love what Steph Curry said. He was being interviewed, and Steph Curry's an unbelievable basketball player, and they're asking about all these accolades, and he's saying, hey, all that is great, but I'll tell you, I'm more than my jersey. I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Here's a man who probably accomplished anything he needs to accomplish, has a lot of money, and he's saying, I got it, but that ain't it. Uh, Some of us, look, it'd be awesome. I hope you accomplish a lot of your goals. I hope you make a lot of money and tie to the church, and I hope, like all this, (laughs) I hope the building campaign would be nice too, you know. I hope you accomplish all of that. I mean, it'd be awesome for you, and I really do mean that, but when you get there, you'll recognize that's not it. That's not it, more zeros in your bank account, that's not it. That's not it, it's Christ and Jesus Christ. Here he's saying, I had it and I had it all, but that's not it. I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing. Here it is right here. This should be the heartbeat for every person in here because this right here, I believe, cures and fixes the problem of the soul. You wanna wanna see, man, you, you wanna see our nation get healthier? Tell people about Jesus. It's the cure for the sickness of this country and of this world. Jesus is the cure for the sickness of this culture. It's it's, it's the cure for the sickness that we're seeing of people straying from God's design in many levels. It's, it's, It's the cure. Jesus is the cure. And he's saying, this is why, man, know Jesus Christ, because he will govern your soul. He will call you out when you're going towards sin. He will call you out when your heart is filled with jealousy. He will call you out when you're self-promoting. He will call you out when you're filled with pride. He will call you out when you think that this world is all there is to offer. Jesus will call you out, but know him, know him. Let let me just, let me tell you something. He says, know him for his sake. I suffered the loss of all things, and they're rubbish. This is, that word is dung. He said, it's, it's rubbish. So here, here, here's what he's saying, like, man, look, there's going to be a time where all this stuff doesn't work, but I hope and pray that when you hit rock bottom, you meet Christ. I hope somewhere in here, in the midst of all this stuff that you're pursuing, because you think this is going to make life better. He's saying, I've had it all, and it's worthless, but you want to know Christ. Press into Christ even when things are hard. Keep pressing in, because people are going to fail you. Your, your, you know, your, your friends will criticize you. This will happen in in life, but press in to Christ. How can he say that when he's in the prison cell? Look, the band's going to come up here, and, and I'm going to I'm going to finish. But uh, in this room, and I don't know what many of you are carrying in here today, but let me just share something with you. As your brother in Christ, you will experience some deep pains in your life, and you you will experience. You will experience some things that you do that you just don't understand. God, how can I do this? I say I love you. Why do I keep doing this? I don't want to do it, God. You will experience stuff that God exposes in your heart. Like, where is this jealousy coming from? How did this get here? Why, why am I like this? Why am I so self-promoting? Why do I care what people think? 
Why do I devalue myself? Why do I want to stay in bondage and not be free? Why can't I just be free? You'll experience some hard stuff. You'll experience moments and dark nights of the soul where you're wondering, why don't you come through, God? I feel like I'm clinging on to you, Christ, and it's like you're not coming through. And just like Paul says, rejoice. Let me tell every Christian today in this room, I'm going to first speak to the Christians. I know, I know, because it hasn't for me either. Life won't go the way you've planned it, and you'll experience a lot of pain. Can I just share something with you? It's going to be okay. You experience pain in your family? Me too, church. It's going to be okay. You've failed over and over and you're disappointed in yourself. It's going to be okay. Your career's not taking off and turning out the way you thought. It's going to be okay. You've, you've gone through a divorce and never thought you would. You don't know what to do. It's going to be okay. Your children are not following the Lord the way you thought they would. It's going to be okay. He is God. He is so powerful. In the midst of our suffering, and that's where we come to know Him, to know the God we've read who comforts. And you see Him just swoop in in the middle of our pain, and He comforts us. And this God we hear about who provides in the middle of our pain, He just swoops in and provides. And this God who we didn't know if He can really heal, and He swoops in does what only he can do. But church, it's not going to be your pedigree. It's not going to be you. It's not you. It's Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. <laughs> Everything else in life is doing this. Jesus is the only consistent. For he who hears his words and obeys them is like a wise man builds his house on rock. Do you know him today? See, if you know him, you can have confidence in your prison cell of pain today. It's going to be okay. You'll hurt and you'll cry, and you'll question, it's going to be okay. 